Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Voice of Authority webinar brought to you today by Morgan Sindel. My name is Toby Fox. I'm the Managing Director at 3Fox, the marketing agency for councils. And our job is to keep our network of local authorities and the development community of developers, investors, and their influencers connected. In normal times, we'd be doing that through uh, events, through uh, publications, through brand and place consultancy. But during lockdown, we've been doing it through webinars. We have a platform called SiteMatch365, at which councils brief developers on development opportunities, followed by focused online meetings. And this, the Voice of Authority, a platform for councils to discuss the challenges they face, the influences on their decision making, and issues of urgency. We're going to be back on Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. to discuss how innovations in data analysis are fueling town centre recovery with three case studies that you can't afford to miss if the state of the high street affects your work. Now, I used the phrase case studies there. Earlier this week, a prominent figure on the London property scene asked me, uh, with the email equivalent of an exasperated sigh, when will webinar titles stop being questions, starting with the word how, and be retitled with what? After four months, I've had a belly full of the how. It's good to see some case studies starting to appear. And I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. And we have another case study today, the first in a series of three webinars over the next three months, examining an exemplar of collaboration. 10 district and borough councils, a county council and a, a LEP have signed a memorandum of understanding, appointed a senior leadership team, launched a website and a visual identity, signaling Hertfordshire's commitment to collaborative working and getting things done under the banner Hertfordshire Growth Board. I've been involved in a lot of cross-border coalitions, but this has been by far the most cohesive, coherent and driven alliance that I've come across. And in a moment, we're going to turn to our superb panel to explore how and why the Growth Board was formed, its priorities and its ambitions for the future. Two small bits of housekeeping before we hand over the session to them. Firstly, viewers, uh, let me remind you that in about half an hour to maybe 40 minutes, we'll be putting your questions to the panel. So please make use of the Q&A function on your screens to stimulate the conversation and encourage our panelists to share their experience with us. And secondly, a reminder that we'll be loading snap polls onto your screens during the session. Your responses to those will fuel our conversation and provide material for our report on the session afterwards. But before all that, it's up to our panelists to inspire you. In anticipation of some fascinating insights, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce in alphabetical order, Rob Bridge, the CEO of Wellin Hatfield Borough Council and lead CEO of Hertfordshire Growth Board and chair of Hertfordshire Recovery Coordinating Group. Patsy Dell, who is director of Hertfordshire Growth at Hertfordshire Growth Board. Matt Partridge, who is CEO at Stevenage Borough Council. Councillor David Williams, the leader of Hertfordshire County Council and chair of the Hertfordshire Growth Board. And David Roussel, our area director at Morgan Sindel. Turning to you first, David, Councillor Williams. Can you set the scene for us? Tell us a little of the story of the creation of the Growth Board and what Growth Boards are. So Toby, uh, thank you. Firstly, thank you for arranging this uh, webinar and also uh, thanks to David for Morgan Sindel providing support for it. Um, it's a fantastic um, opportunity for us to talk about the Growth Board over the three sessions that, have, uh, that are actually planned. So, Focusing on the Hertfordshire Growth Board, there are three elements here that I just want to spend a few moments talking about. Firstly, Hertfordshire the place. Secondly, the policy context from central government. And then thirdly, our experience of partnership working, which we brought into this um, agreement. So firstly, Hertfordshire the place. I think it's really important that uh, those watching this webinar just recognize what a significant economy Hertfordshire has got. Um, before COVID, um, we were reporting a 40.7 billion GVA gross value added economy uh, that we have in Hertfordshire. We have some fantastic assets. And those assets are in many respects the legacy of what's gone before. And there's a fantastic history of place shaping in Hertfordshire. So if we go back to the Garden Cities, um, the Garden City movement, which brought us Letchworth and Welling Garden City, 
that was all about bringing together town and country, uh, places where people could live and work with the best of what um, um, the Industrial Revolution had brought to Britain at the end of the 19th century, uh, but also then some of the advantages of living in the country. And that's what, that, that was the philosophy behind Letchworth and behind um, Welling Garden City. We then, in the post-Second World War period, had the uh, Hertfordshire New Towns. So Stevenage was the first, Hemel Hempstead, Hatfield and Welling Garden City. Now, in those settlements, we have, in many respects, the crown jewels of, of Hertfordshire's employment. So when I look at Stevenage uh, and the Gunnels Wood Road area, when I look at, um, at Hemel and what's been um, delivered and what is now uh, available in Maylands, these are genuinely the crown jewels of our economy and we have some fantastic employers. We then also have the example that as the defence industry left Hertfordshire in the 80s and 90s, uh, there were interventions. There was intervention in Leavesden where Rolls-Royce were and now we have uh, Warner Brothers and the Harry Potter uh, uh, visitor attraction. Go over to Hatfield where de Havilland were, British Aerospace were, and now we have the business park there with Ocado, BT, uh, the university, uh, a fantastic uh, intervention in the Hertfordshire economy. So um, against that background, we know that we will be planning, we are planning to deliver something like 100,000 homes over the next 15 years, the, the next local plan period going through into the 2030s. Uh, we know that the population of Hertfordshire is going to rise by something like 175,000. We know, therefore, that we need to be providing something of the order of 100,000 uh, new jobs. And the scale of that challenge, the infrastructure we need, uh, the decisions that we need to be making across Hertfordshire, rather than just simply in the, within the boundaries of the local planning authorities, has led us to take this more holistic view, uh, a boundaryless view uh, across Hertfordshire. And that's given us some real insights in terms of key corridors, key clusters, uh, where we will need to invest, particularly in terms of new infrastructure. So that's the place shaping challenge that the, the Growth Board is uh, going to be addressing uh, across the outstandingly strong Hertfordshire economy. But inevitably, um, we also have to reflect the fact that COVID is going to be a significant challenge in terms of employment. And it's, um, as you'll have seen, the, um, the analysis across the country in terms of how, um, what a step back the UK economy is going to take, then Hertfordshire's 40.7 billion GVA economy is also undoubtedly going to take a step back and we need to get through that in the most effective way. And the second thing is the context here and going back to 2012 with um, um, Lord Heseltine and his no stone un unturned uh, policy for economic growth, successive governments have pursued this approach that uh, they want to work with the, the willing and they want uh, those uh, partners then to be accountable. And it's on that basis that we've seen the growth deals that have been struck principally with city regions. So the deals with Greater Manchester, Sheffield, Tees Valley, the West of England, etc. Um, often with uh, elected mayors and mayoral combined authorities. Now, our Hertfordshire economy is as big as some of those, if not bigger than some of those economies that have had those deals. And we feel it's important that those deals are available to an area like Hertfordshire and hence our ambition to pursue a growth deal with um, the Ministry for Housing Communities and Local Government. And indeed, we are actively doing that at the moment. And then the third thing I just want to highlight is that we do have a track record of partnership working. We're obviously a two tier local government area. Um, I think we have outstanding relationships between the two tiers of local government the 10 districts and boroughs and the county council, but we also have a coterminous local enterprise partnership with whom we have excellent relationships, uh, the constabulary, health, uh, further education, uh, higher education. There is a really good um, track record of partnership working 
And from my perspective, the Growth Board builds on that in order to take forward a potential deal for the place that is Hertfordshire uh, and, the, uh, and to ensure that as we look across the next 15, 20, 25, 30 years, we can really be proud of the growth that we have delivered um, and that it is inclusive and that it is good for our place and the conditions that exist within Hertfordshire. Thank you, Councillor. And that's, that's um, spoken with real confidence and, and a really comprehensive um, a, a approach. Rob, um, as, as CEO of, of Wellin Hatfield Borough Council, um, what, what does the Growth Board mean for, for play, the places of Hertfordshire? Uh, and what does this new way of working bring for, for you and your residents? Is it particularly important now to have the Growth Board during COVID-19 to, to share the ideas for, for, for growth and recovery across the county? Uh, uh, thank you, Toby, and, and welcome to everyone. And, and thank you, for, uh, as David says, for putting on today's webinar. Um, I am on my best behaviour, but having looked at the attendee list, I know I've got a number of my councillors across various parties uh, watching in on me, and I'm sure they'll feed back to me in the coming days on how I perform. So, absolutely think that what we've been doing in Hertfordshire has showed a great amount of ambition, um, but also, importantly, joining up the various uh, councils that we have and the LEP to try and improve the place for Hertfordshire and obviously for me and for the councillors at Well in Hatfield what it means to those to those residents in our area has been absolutely vital. I think what's impressed me and my colleagues is the maturity of conversation between leaders regardless of what political parties they are they are aligned to they have all been talking about the place and wanting us to engage with the MHCLG to ensure that we could deliver uh, for our residents and businesses as a whole so um, I think it's an exciting opportunity that's uh, been vital to get the type of dialogue and traction and the, with government because actually for government and for well in Hatfield I could have a conversation directly with the MHCLG about supporting our area and we have done around certain things with Homes England but there is a much stronger voice if it is 11 plus the LEP coming to government and saying look let's ensure Hertfordshire is the place that our communities and businesses want to thrive in, live in and, and get opportunity in. Um, so I think in doing that, joining up the, the, the opportunity on housing, transport and some of the softer stuff. So climate, which is so important to everybody. And we're all trying to answer that question individually when actually there's a lot more we can do collectively is really important. And we're also looking at you know, how we can use our communities across the whole area to help develop what is right. And the brand of Hertfordshire, it's easy, you know, David's made the point around the sort of economic position that Hertfordshire is. So it's easy for government and other places to just let's say, well, that'll be okay. That'll be okay after COVID. But that isn't the case. And we've got a lot of work to do to ensure that we actually don't fall behind. Um, so I think in doing that, I think, again, the leaders have been really, really positive about creating that capacity because you can't do this just absorbing in the day job. So Patsy's going to be talking in a little while, but having a dedicated director to lead on the growth work, uh, a, you know, agreement from, from my leader and my council for me to take a leading role in respects of the uh, chief exec lead, I think is really, really helpful because we need that capacity because it is a big ask and a big opportunity. In respect of your point around COVID and coming back to that, we had progressed really, really well up until March and, and, and lockdown. And obviously that's changed the country. It certainly has changed Hertfordshire. And I think what's really important now is that we don't lose what Hertfordshire has been about and we are able to help mobilise Hertfordshire returning to better than it was before, but as a minimum. So David made reference to the economy. There are job concerns in Hertfordshire like they are in the rest of the country. So how can we, with a growth deal, make sure that there's the right um, environment for our businesses to pick up the pieces and start to thrive again and ensure that we can have employment and opportunity for everybody in the whole of the county? 
And when I look at that, we have got some statistics that certain areas are going to struggle more. I can talk about Welling Hatfield specifically, who actually is in the top five, le more likely to bounce back quickly in respects of the impact of COVID, but then in Hertfordshire with other areas which are less likely to bounce back. So actually working together on a recovery growth deal is about making sure Hertfordshire doesn't leave certain parts of it behind and make sure that we're all working for the for the benefit of all. And I think that's what we're, we should be about, that system leadership, that place-based thinking and making sure what we do is right. And I think it's really exciting. I've really enjoyed the last two years being involved in developing that. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Rob. And there are some questions coming in from the viewers uh, already. Do keep them coming through the Q&A function. I also noticed someone raising their hand asking to, to, to make a point. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to tell you I'm running these, uh, these sessions in a, in a very autocratic manner um, and we're not uh, providing a stage for, for anybody else. Um, but we do welcome your, your questions and your, your input to the conversation channel that through the Q&A function, please. Um, Patsy, um, we, this, Rob mentioned that the sort of length of time that, 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 um, that goes into the creation of, of, of a growth board. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the internal sort of machinations of, of it all and what attracts you to the job, how your job function works, how the board's been structured to work effectively, but also maybe um, from an external point of view, the promises that were made through the uh, memorandum of understanding, what, what were they and what do they mean for, for Hertfordshire and its residents? So, I mean, as David and, and Rob have both said, the Growth Board's been um, set up about two years ago, and we've been a huge investment by leaders and chief execs and teams across Hertfordshire in developing that, that programme and that long-term ambition around place. And I think, you know, it's a testament to the fact that they've created this role, um, that, you know, this work's really important. And I hear those messages frequently from leaders that, that, you know, the ambition that we've identified, the long-term place and economic recovery and economic resilience ambitions that we have are absolutely right for, for Hertfordshire. And they are the things that we should be doing. So I think there's that consensus around, you know, why we're doing this and what we should be doing for the benefit of Hertfordshire now and in the future. Um, I'm really motivated by Kind of working collaboratively. I've been lucky. I've trained as a planner. You know, working in this this field of supporting the delivery of of growth and new communities in in high growth areas within Oxcam and latterly in Hertfordshire. So, you know, I feel like really privileged to be in this position of working with leaders, chief execs, and councils to try and cement and support that collaboration so that, you know, the sum of the parts of our endeavours is, is greater than, you know, we could achieve on our own. And that's what gets me out of bed every morning to try and keep, you know, Hertfordshire moving together, doing the things that we'll get more from and working with the let so that, you know, our, our strategy covers that economic resilience and recovery through to place-based solutions. So genuinely, joining all that up. And I think the, of the MOU just reflects publicly the statement, you know, 12 organizations signing up to a document like that, taking it through their democratic political processes is meaningful. You know, it speaks to, there's an endeavor that we're trying to do here over time and place and it's important. So, you know, genuinely, I hope we really continue in this vein and, and get on and really deliver the programs that we've got and all credit to all the leaders you know been here two years and seeing 12 around a growth board table having some really open you know frank conversation you know identifying a collective vision putting aside the things for that conversation but coming together over the things you know housing economic growth the need for infrastructure delivering good growth all those things really important for our area and our place and Yes, you know, I really hope we continue uh, working in this way uh, in Hertfordshire. An exciting time to be to be working in, in Hertfordshire, Patsy. Yeah, it really um, is. 
Matt, I'm, I'm interested, as, as CEO of, of Stephen, Stevenage Borough Council, I'm interested, uh, firstly, firstly, in thanking you for upholding uh, standards of uh, uh, working attire, um, and, and secondly, <laughs> hearing from you a little about um, how the, the Growth Board is going to engage with the public. I mean, how is each member going to encourage dialogue within their communities? And, and, and I guess beyond that, I mean, you, you've been 35 years in, in local government. You've seen everything. You've been there. You've got the T-shirt. You've got, you've got the tie. Um, what makes this initiative particularly exciting in, in your eyes? Why is being part of the growth board so, so important? Thanks, Toby. It's actually 36 years, I think, this year, which is quite astounding, uh, to be quite frank. I don't know how that you've managed to uh, survive that long, but I'm pleased I have done. Uh, taking the, the first question then, I think for me, and going back to David and Rob's uh, initial comments. Uh, I think it's important to stress that you know the key aim of the growth board is to ensure that the county, its residents and businesses benefit from good, well-planned and sustainable place-based growth. Now with regards to encouraging dialogue, um, at a high level we've done a lot of work on developing a common strategy for the growth board. Uh, we have developed some really clear um, exciting looking uh, branding for the growth board as well. It should be recognizable, hopefully, uh, to lots of people in the very near uh, future. We've worked very hard on developing a, a microsite, which will provide greater opportunities for residents and businesses to read what the board is doing and the decisions it's taking uh, as well going forwards. We've, uh, we're developing briefings for uh, public and business sector partners uh, as well. We're also developing a stakeholder bulletin uh, as well. Now, but for me, though, in terms of engaging people, this has got to be done through uh, multiple different means. Many of us have got uh, established mechanisms already in place. Uh, we have at Stevenage a chronicle publication that goes out three times a year to all of our residents, at residents meetings. We use social media uh, extensively, as do our colleague authorities uh, as well. And I think it's going to be important that we use all of these means from now on to try and get the messages out over the coming mm -hmm. sort of weeks and months to give people a real chance to engage and sort of you know, inform what's going to happen across the county. And, and for us in Stevenage, and we are a, a cooperative council, so we're really proud on how we engage with the residents um, on all sorts of different matters. But what's going to happen is in reality, we'll learn from each other over the coming months and you know, we'll share good practice and we'll develop our means as we go along. And uh, I'm, I'm confident with the efforts the team are putting in that uh, we'll get the messages out there in a, hopefully a clear way for residents to understand and then engage with. And, and, in, and, and in terms of uh, sort of your, your career, your, your experience, and why, why, do, why do growth boards matter? Why, why is this more exciting than all the other initiatives that you've come across in, in, in all those years, Matt? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing I'd say to that would be that I'm, I'm honoured to be part of something that's going to make such a fantastic contribution to the lives of those who live and work in the county. It's a huge honour. Uh, for me, being part of the board, it's really a once in a lifetime opportunity to shape and inform the nature of growth interventions that take place across a whole spectrum of areas from you know, transport and housing through to you know, regeneration and wealth building and much more uh, as well. It's without doubt for me the biggest programme I've ever been involved in during my uh, career. And I feel you know, a huge um, responsibility on my shoulders for doing the right thing and making the right decisions. But the fact that we're doing this as a group of 11 local authorities and local enterprise partnership, I think demonstrates an absolute shared commitment to maximising opportunities for the county and for each district and borough and for those that we serve. Brilliant, Matt. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to, to David Roussel at, uh, at Morgan Sindel. Um, David, t tell us a little bit uh, about your, your work in, in Hertfordshire and how you've been engaging with the, the county's authorities sort of historically, you know, in the, in the recent past. And then if you could take on this, uh, this weighty burden as our representative for the private sector, um, how do you feel the development community is going to benefit from the formation of, of the growth board? Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone and thank you Toby for in, inviting me to join the panel today and facilitating such a valuable um, discussion. Uh, for us, Morgan Sindel, um, we've been based in Welling Garden City as a local Hertfordshire contractor over 40 years, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's really important that we can be involved for us in this discussion today. So 
thank you um, and welcome to everyone joining. Um, so in, in terms of your, your question, in terms of, of, of from our perspective, from a, from a contracting tier one perspective, um, as, as was mentioned earlier by David, the, the post COVID economic landscape presents a number of stark challenges as we enter UK's what could be one of the most serious recession for generations. But the built environment will have a huge role to play in driving forward economic growth and bolstering communities. It's essential um, that public and private sectors are working collaboratively to deliver this development and ensure it delivers economic and social value. Organisations like the Hearts Growth Board have obviously got a huge role to play in enabling that process. I mean, we heard some statistics earlier, but the population in Hertfordshire is expected to rise by circa 175,000 in the next 15 years, which means a huge requirement and projection for up to 100,000 houses, as well as schools and public buildings and community schemes. A strategic collaborative approach between the public and private sector, I think, will really enhance the productivity and drive towards sustained growth across the region. I think back in from the LEP, in Hertfordshire, I think demonstrates that the private sector voices have been listened to in the forming of the Hearts Growth Board Memorandum of Understanding. So it's been really good from our perspective to see that. And we really look forward to, to supporting it going forward. And um, in answer to your other question, really, I think the, the government's industrial strategy is, is obviously named infrastructure as one of the foundations of productivity. Our national infrastructure and construction pipeline is worth anything around £600 billion. And, Public infrastructure and investment have doubled in a decade by 2022-2023. And this will have a knock-on effect for local government and infrastructure. I think from a more macro perspective, the government has also announced the launch of sector deals and partnerships between government and industry as one of their key focus areas to increase productivity. And some of the first of these will be in construction, and we look forward to continuing to build strong relationships with our public sector partners across Hertfordshire. And we're already doing that, working with Hearts County Council and District Council, such as St Albans. I think, um, for me, what's really important, and from, a, from our perspective as a, as, a, as, a, as a national contractor with a regional focus, is that we, we help to develop um, and support you know, such powerful initiatives as the Hertfordshire Growth Board and continue to support public and private partnerships, be it formal or informal. One highly example of this and the potential that public-private joint ventures can achieve, and these offers a vehicle to, to enable strategic regeneration and transformation of UK towns and, and obviously city centres, which has been discussed earlier. Um, the public-private joint venture model can create an effective, productive partnership which enables a large-scale strategic development, enable us to look at the bigger picture. I think an example for that, and to pick up on your other question, Toby, around what we're currently doing, where we're currently seeing collaboration within Hertfordshire. In, in, based in Hertford, we've got Chalk Dean Developments, which is a, a, a public-private joint venture between Morgan Sindel Investments and Hearts Living. Hearts County Council very much involved in, in supporting and driving that. It was established in 2018 for the purpose of building high-quality, sustainable homes, prime locations. Mm -hmm. And these are, I think, a brilliant example of of where public-private partnerships can be and when, they can, when they, when, and when they can be in action. From a construction perspective, the collaborative partnerships that sit at the heart of these joint ventures can bring together a broad range of specialists with open, productive conversations. At an early pre-construction phase between architects, sector-specific specialists, and obviously public and private stakeholders. Um, and, and picking up on, on, on a point from earlier as well, and in terms of the opportunities that we have within the regeneration and construction, the construction sector is the sixth largest source of employment in the UK and contributes to 7% of the UK's GDP. So it's critical for placemaking, economic development and job creation, and essential to Boris Johnson's recent statement about the New Deal and the UK's post-COVID-19 recovery. But as such, it's essential for us, and I think all of our stakeholders and partners, that social value remains a real part of our strategic priority for the sector, and that construction and our, and, our, and our work within Hertfordshire delivers both economic and social value to the wider social, economic and environmental benefits of the communities. I mean, enriching communities and creating employment opportunities and developing skills will be particularly prevalent as we go into the post-COVID um, period that we're going into. 
I think this also, the post-COVID landscape held a significant change for how we live and work. I think this webinar today is a really good example of that. And it, there will be an impact on our town centres and maybe how they develop and evolve in response. Um, it's safe to say that in the future, town centres and high streets may look different to how they look now. The developing public realm that responds to altered needs post-COVID will be crucial to attracting people into our town still, as cities by creating safe, accessible spaces. Yeah. I think we've seen the importance of digital infrastructure as well going forward, yeah. and that will be a big part in terms of our placemaking. And my, and my final point really is, is, um, is around how the continued working and collaboration with the mixed-use schemes in our towns and town centres can really help to focus what the future could look like for all of us. Fantastic, David. I think yeah, all, all, all good points. And, and as all as all good debates do, uh, we raise more questions than we answer. Um, but I think I think if uh, if Morgan Sindel, if if what you're saying is um, is is generally true, then then it speaks volumes for for the outreach of of the councils at, in Hertfordshire and and the growth board in its uh, while it's being formed uh, in terms of establishing those sort of relationships with uh, partners and, um, uh, and and other organisations across the county uh, to take you with them. Um, David, uh, Councillor Williams, um, we, we've heard now a, a, a little about the, the process of setting up the, the growth board and, and the kind of context for it and the background and the drivers. Um, what can you tell us about the future and where, where can we expect our Hertfordshire Growth Board to be in, in 12 months time? What do you hope to have achieved and, 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 and has that changed much given the, the pandemic background? So um, in 12 months time, Toby, um, we will, I um, am confident, have secured a deal with MXCLG. So much of our focus at the moment is pursuing that growth deal, uh, the sort of growth deal, as I referred to, earlier, that the Merrill Combined Authorities have uh, secured. Uh, we all know that the government is going to be publishing a devolution white paper in September. And um, the government has made very clear that economic growth has a key part to play uh, in leveling up and in dealing with recovery. We want to be playing our part in that. And an essential is securing a deal with MHCLG in order to provide the funding, the powers, uh, to enable us then to take forward our agenda for Hertfordshire. So that will be a very, and this is a, a big ask of government, and we're putting up boundaries here. Um, inevitably, government is focused on the north of the country, but uh, my plea to the government would be, don't overlook the really strong economies in the um, southeast of England, uh, which are a real powerhouse for the country, and it's important that we have the freedoms and flexibilities that others enjoy in city regions in order that we can move forward at even greater pace. Yeah, yeah, ambitious, ambitious, ambitious stuff. Um, uh, Rob, I mean, we're talking about the, the whole of the southeast here. Um, as, as a CEO, what sort of um, uh, uh, interaction, engagement have you had with, with neighbouring uh, local authorities, with, with the Barnets and the Enfields and the Harrows? Uh, how involved are they in, in, in the discussions and, and formation of HGB and in your, your view of the future? Okay, so I mean, uh, rather than just focus on the South and the London, there's a, a big connection between the Essex authorities around the Gilston New Town. So there's been a lot of work uh, around that sort of side of the, the county boundary. I think with, 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 the, with the sort of South and the London authorities, obviously there's the London plan and there's a lot of engagement between uh, the councils and the East of England and the impact of the London plan on the sort of outer regions of London and Hertfordshire. You know, we've heard before that places like Hertfordshire need to take the heat out of London, which is not a very helpful statement. So we, you know, what we're trying to do is engage with government around our answer for Hertfordshire, which doesn't get pulled into that London situation particularly. And I think London are trying to find an answer for the amount of housing that they want or need to deliver. I don't think, you know, personally, I don't think we've had lots of engagement personally, Diane, directly with those London boroughs at the moment. 
um, but you know that's two two ways. David's putting his hand up, so he he may have. I haven't. Then uh, politicians may have, um, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be talking to cross boundary uh, around the whole of the county because at the north of the county we have the Cambridge Oxfordshire arc. And the impact of that arc on the north part of the county is going to be vital to the right growth and place shaping in that area. Absolutely. And, and, and in the question um, that we put to the viewers in, in the poll, um, what, what are the greatest attractors for Hertfordshire? Uh, location was, was by far the, the greatest, according, according to our viewers. I should have mentioned that question about um, neighbouring boroughs was asked by viewer Danny Kay. And David, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously, when I think about um, uh, our growth deal and some of the powers that we're looking for, inevitably, when it comes to transport, things like devolved... Um, uh, transport budgets, franchising powers, are something we look very enviously at when we see the red buses across the, uh, uh, the boundaries. Um, there are some important flows in and out of um, London. Um, obviously, people uh, leaving Hertfordshire to commute, but then equally, there are lots of people now, um, particularly in Rob's area, actually, coming to the university out of London, coming to work at Tesco out of London, coming to work at Ocado out of London. So we need to recognize those flows. Um, more interestingly, if I look at Enfield, for instance, the question about the Enfield Relief Road has been one that's been on the, um, sort of on the agenda between us for a while. When you look at the development that's gonna happen at Meridian Water, um, you know, I'd encourage colleagues in Enfield to be thinking about some of the strengths that we've got in that corridor going up to Cambridge, particularly life sciences, uh, which is so strong in Stevenage um, uh, and well in Hatfield, also to a degree in Harlow. So, you know, is that an opportunity for Meridian Water to build on that um, agglomeration? and that focus on life sciences that we have in the corridor going up to uh, Cambridge. I, I know from, from our work with, with Enfield in the past and, and Mark Bradbury and his, his team there that that, um, that that corridor has been very much in, in, in their mind in terms of promoting the, the opportunities for, for investment in Enfield itself. So I'm sure that's a, that's a conversation that, um, that can be taken further. Thank you, David. Um, there's a question from a uh, viewer, Mike Diath, about the uh, LEP deal on, on modular homes. We're going to have another two sessions with Hertfordshire over the next couple of months, and the LEP will form um, part of the conversation in another session. So I'm going to defer that question, Mike, if I may, to, to a future session. Um, but um, uh, Andrew uh, Winterskill has asked um, whether there's a, a Hertfordshire view. Patsy, a question for you, I think, on the implications of the government's recently published 2018 based household projections for planning across the country. So uh, I think the meat of the question is, is there a desire to retain ambitions for significant growth and betterment across the county uh, against the background of those lower growth household forecasts? Um, I mean, we, we have, David talked earlier about our uh, target for housing delivery up to the mid 2030s of 100,000 homes. And obviously we've been, been working on that for a while. Um, the, the figures from government, you know, your, your target numbers do move around as everyone who's involved in this will, will know as household projections and new methodologies and things come and go. Um, so we'll obviously take account of that. But I think what's really clear, you know, Hertfordshire is always going to be a high growth area. Um, we have issues with access, affordability, you know, the latest figures about house price affordability ratios, you know, they're comparable with, with London and you know, Cambridge and Oxford, you know, we are, there are big differences across our county, but, you know, average house prices above 450,000 is, is significant. So it, there's a real relationship between housing pressures and our economic success that we need to deal with. Pre-COVID, we saw significant numbers of people commuting in to help support and service the Hertfordshire economy, particularly public services. So, you know, we're never going to get away from being an area of growth pressure that we need to deal with. And that will certainly continue post 2030 and out to 2050. So I think this is where the leaders coming together and with the LET to really take that long term, long term place perspective, whatever that wherever the number is, it's it's going to be a big one for Hertfordshire. That's you know the nature of how we live today. So taking that long term perspective on what's the infrastructure to support good growth. 
how do we make sure our growth ambitions and our economic ambitions are aligned and working in a complementary way are always going to be questions for us. And that's why I think the collaborative way of working with the growth board and taking that longer term perspective is absolutely spot on to try and deal with those challenges. You know, the numbers may, may change over that time, but I think the direction of travel rather than the noise is a consistent one around those sorts of pressures. And we need a really effective model to do justice to those challenges in Hertfordshire. And I think we've got one and are working in that way systematically to try and deal with it. Great stuff, Patsy, thank you. Yes. Want to add to that? Uh, Toby, if I can just come in, I mean, yeah, I, I just add a couple of things on that. Um, when you look at our local planning authorities, some of them are very tightly bound in terms of their uh, boundaries. And um, yes, I'm sure we will see um, where we've got those tighter boundaries. So Watford, Stevenage um, are sort of classic examples of that. We will see densification and town centres will change. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, building heights are shooting up uh, in Watford as we um, have uh, greater density. But at some stage, you need to come to a decision about whether, for instance, you need a new settlement and we follow the um, our legacy of um, um, garden cities and have a new settlement. And that's a very difficult decision for individual uh, planning authorities to take. You need to have the, the wider spatial planning vision. And that's something that I've no doubt we will have to contend with in the years to come. It's not an immediate problem for us. Um, but when you think about the sort of growth that we might need to deliver beyond 2035, I think we probably will be thinking about um, whether we should uh, contemplate uh, a or a number of new settlements in Hertfordshire. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, again, exciting, exciting stuff coming, coming, coming forward. Um, Matt, uh, a, a question for the whole panel, but but I'll I'll, I'll start with Matt. Um, there's an anonymous atten attendee asking a question, which is usually very portentous, but um, but in this case, I, I don't think so. I think it's a it's a it's a really interesting question around infrastructure. And you you've been uh, involved in in regeneration for for a long time, and 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 um, have a, a number of exciting plans. I know. Um, but how do you how do you ensure that the right infrastructure gets um, gets put into to Hertfordshire to support the sort of growth that we've been talking about and then another question from a different viewer that relates to that how how do we know what infrastructure we need post COVID working habits have changed mm -hmm. people are working from home do we need to be providing so much for, for, for commuters what, what sort of views are you taking on, on these issues of infrastructure Matt yeah thanks Toby yeah it's, it's um it's, it's a really big question um, and one that I know that we all face, I think, across uh, across our different uh, authorities and, and different areas. Um, I mean, ultimately, uh, it comes down to uh, to taking the time to do the the, the hard work of the planning uh, that, that goes with it. I think um, yeah, looking at what I think for us, what we're thinking about is uh, there's going to be 100,000 homes, say, coming into the county up to the into 2030s, and I think you know people will generally be happier to uh, accept that growth uh, in, in their area if they see that actually that comes with the right infrastructure uh, and so on. So I, I think yeah, that one of the key bits of work that we're doing with this, whilst we've got a whole section of, uh, of a programme uh, around affordable housing delivery and, and bringing forward housing faster than perhaps was originally planned, there's also there's mm -hmm. lots of work uh, happening around things like looking at connectivity um, across the county, both uh, you know, south and north and so on. Um, looking at you know, what, how you build into your town centres and, and you develop those to meet the needs of, uh, of increased populations within your towns and around your towns uh, as well. Focuses upon areas like you know, climate change and sustainability uh, and so on. There's a lot of work going on around key projects that are going to help to you know, reduce emissions and so on across the county. And I think you've got to put it into into a package really uh, that makes that growth attractive to local people and to businesses uh, as well, rather than just you know plonking a load of housing somewhere and hoping it's going to kind of work out. So you've got to think about your schools and so on, your roads, and all, all of that thinking is being done through the work of the growth board. Uh, we've got two um, two focused corridors and a north and a south corridor that we're focusing upon with projects for each being developed that inform the prospectus that the government will receive uh, in due course. 
And both of those are giving a lot of thought and attention to the right infrastructure that's going to uh, hopefully make the growth positive and have it well received by local people. Um, the second part of the question, sorry, what was that again, please, Toby? Well, I actually, well, let's, uh, it, it was really around uh, infrastructure and how, um, how the picture is changing. You know? so, so on the yeah. one hand, how are you going to fund the infrastructure that's needed to su support the kind of growth we've been talking about? But on the other hand, how do you predict what that infrastructure is going to be? Yeah, uh, I think that's a really good question, especially over a program that's going to last, say, 10 years, 15, 20 years uh, and beyond. And you know, we're wrestling with that locally within the uh, town centre within Stevenage as well, in terms of you know, what's, what's out there and available today. Uh, there could be completely different demands in, say, five uh, or 10 years time. I think all you can do with that uh, is to remain to a degree flexible. Uh, you might have you know, an ambition, for example, you know, in developing digital town centres. But a digital town centre for today won't be what it is in probably sort of 30, 40 years time. You're going to have to evolve and develop your plans as you go along, you know, using best sort of trusted and tested technology uh, en route. Um, but you aren't going to have all the answers. I mean, right now, you know, we're rightly focusing upon electric vehicles and charging points and so on. But you know, there was a time back in the day when we were focusing upon diesel cars being the answer and probably in 30, 40 years time we'll be into hydrogen fuel cell cars or something like that. So you know, it's going to keep, it will keep on evolving. I think the challenge for the board is going to be to keep on top of uh, developments um, on, on the science as it comes forward and so on and to reflect that in our plans going forwards. Brilliant, Matt, thank you very much. Um, Rob, um, I, I feel free to pick up on, on, on any of the points that, that we've uh, we've covered so far but there's a there's a question um, of particular importance to to residents in, in all places and that's in in the face of change how do we retain uh, our character how do we retain individuality and, and what makes this place special and and why we came here in the first place or why we've chosen to stay so so how would you talk to, to your residents about um, protecting individuality versus this sort of a uh, common an, a, a approach, a, a county-wide approach to, to growth? So I think um, at, at the beginning, Matt made reference to a brand for Hertfordshire as a whole, mm. which is about making sure Hertfordshire is a great place for people to come into, live, work, etc. But also recognising in that the individuality of place for uh, the different areas. And we have you know, quite a mixture, as you say, across the whole of Hertfordshire. And I'm, I feel very lucky to, to be chief executive where I have one of the new towns in Hatfield and obviously one of the second garden town in Welling Garden City, which is uh, 100 years old this year. And actually, both of those towns are completely different, but are really important in respects of the uniqueness of them and how you develop them. So I think what is really key is working within the growth board to make sure that infrastructure and all the big asks are happening in a consistent and appropriate way, but recognising that below that, we will have the council's partners working on those individual aspects to make sure we keep those uh, characteristics uh, in, in place is really important. So from, from a well in Hatfield point of view, we have been working on Hatfield uh, 2030 plus partnership. We are instigating this week our Well and Garden City partnership, which is around shaping those places for their characteristics. But they will feed into the growth board to make sure mm. they take the opportunity of the wider collaboration. Stevenage will be doing the same, Watford will be doing the same. We, no, none of this is about losing the place and identity for people. That is so important and why people choose to live and work in different parts of Hertfordshire. Yeah, I think David cool. also put his hand up. Absolutely. And we've got a comment from Maurice Bryce as well saying it's great to have been able to put tribal politics to one side and focus really hard on working together for the good mm. of all our people and, and communities. I'm sure you'd all echo that. David, you wanted to, to pick up? Well, I mean, Rob uh, uh, highlighted a couple of these um, opportunities, but, you know, if I look at um, the um, development board in Stevenage, uh, the Harlow Gilston Garden Towns uh, Board, uh, these are chaired by independent um, uh, non-local government people but are very focused on their areas. So there are similar arrangements uh, in Hemel, with the Hemel Garden communities, the significant development that's going to take place uh, between the existing footprint of Hemel and the M1. So 
where we've got these major initiatives, and these are huge um, uh, urban extensions or town centre redevelopments or a new garden town in the case of Harlow Gilston, uh, the governance is very local, often independent, um, and in that sense is part of the growth board's footprint, but there is real local focus. And I don't know if um, my good colleague, uh, Linda Hazy is on the call, but the extent of the engagement that's happened in Harlow Gilston and the extent of Linda's commitment to that, such that there are just dozens of meetings and she has been renowned for bringing along cakes to those meetings. <laughs> and her baking skills are second to none, but that is real local engagement across multi-million pound, billion pound projects um, that are being delivered within the framework of the growth board. Yeah, I, I, one of the great disadvantages of doing everything digitally is the lack of cakes, I must, I must say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> David, uh, uh, Morgan Sindel, this is music to your ears, I, I imagine. We're hearing about you know, major development schemes coming forward and we're hearing about um, really fine-grained uh, community engagement to make sure that those, those schemes are um, are achieving the wishes of local people and therefore get, get actually get built. Um, give us an idea of where Hertfordshire sits in, in terms of the radar of a company like Morgan Sindel. And where, where, how important is, is this as an area for, for growth and development from the private sector's point of view? And, and does the formation of, of something like a growth board change that picture at all? Um, short answer is yes. Um, considering the webinar would say that, but I can, I can honestly say that as the area director for Northern Home Counties, which Hertfordshire very much sits at the heart of, of my business unit. Um, and also as a resident of Hertfordshire, I'm fortunate enough to live in, in North Hearts District Council. My children go to school in Hertfordshire. So I feel very personally invested in the county as well as from a professional perspective. And I think it's been, from our perspective in the private sector, really refreshing to see the level of engagement between the LEP supporting the Hearts Growth Board and, the, and what appears to be the real appetite to, to engage and work with the private sector in terms of um, delivering some exciting schemes and fantastic opportunities across, across the county. Um, so we look forward to obviously the, taking this forward and, and continuing the debate going forward. Great stuff, thanks David. Um, and, and David Williams, uh, a question here from Ross Weir. Um, what more can be done to uh, get support from, from government? So uh, housing, economic uh, and housing growth will happen if we create the, the right environment and the focus should be a, an exemplar for sustainable transport infrastructure to support ec economic growth and combat climate change. But what, 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 do, we, what do we really get? Uh, what do we have to do to really get that recognition from, from government? How do we make Hertfordshire you know, more important than, than Greater Manchester, than, um, than the South West? Uh, than all those other priorities for, for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we need to show ambition, Toby. Um, you know, whether that's in terms of housing delivery, our willingness to address infrastructure issues, and that's absolutely part of the dialogue that we're currently having with MHCLG right at this moment. Um, if I extend that out, though, um, when it comes to our engagement with health uh, and the demand for health and uh, social care, um, the footprint for health in Hertfordshire and West Essex and uh, obviously the footprint of the growth board. Um, most people's well-being is not resolved by a visit to a hospital or a, a GP's practice. Um, it's about their lifestyle, it's about where they live, the quality of the homes, whether they're employment or not, the support they've got from neighbours and volunteers. So you know, there are so many aspects of this, whether it's uh, in relation to health and well-being. Uh, if I look at transport, we're very fortunate to have the Transport Secretary as one of our um, MPs locally. And uh, those, of, uh, those who know um, uh, the work that Hertfordshire County Council has been doing in recent years, we have a very progressive local transport plan, uh, which is all about sustainable travel. Um, of course, one of the issues now with COVID is that, uh, particularly when you're looking at a polycentric footprint like um, Hertfordshire and the way that people go to work, um, the working from home issue and in the short term, the unattractiveness of going on public transport is actually 
taking people back to their cars again. So how do we deliver more sustainable ways of getting around? Um, we um, have an ambition for mass transit interventions along the A414 corridor. Um, so that's between Hemel Hempstead, St Albans, well in Hatfield, Hartford and Harlow. Um, and so that is in our plans, but it, at the end of the day, it comes down to ambition and it comes down to the willingness for government to uh, support that ambition and devolve to us the powers that will enable us to, uh, to take those um, initiatives forward. And it's all about devolution. And that's why, you know, I'm absolutely on my um, um, tenterhooks in terms of waiting to see the devolution white paper and the opportunity that it can provide to areas like ours. Fantastic. Thanks very much. And, and um, the, 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 we, we sort of, well, let's go to HS2 first. Patsy, I just wanted to ask you quickly, because a, a couple of people are asking this about, does HS2 remove the focus from, from Hertfordshire at all, or, or is, is that of, of, of some benefit for you? So there's a small part of HS2 as you, you enter in Maple Cross in, in Hertfordshire, but then it, it's all about Buckinghamshire and to the north of us. So for, for us, the really big, as David said, interesting infrastructure connectivity projects are around things like the Mass Rapid Transit Scheme that we want to go east-west, which will be an absolute step change, game changer for us. It will be within three kilometers of 50,000 of our planned homes in this period up to, of growth up to the mid 2030s you know what it will do to then unlock future growth is really significant you know it gives us a platform from which to plan going forward it will also help connect up our towns in a you know a, a future of a new way of working from home in Hertfordshire where people might want to use town center hubs so you know we're interested in, the, in our infrastructure we're keeping an eye on what other people are doing and how we connect outwards but, you know, the really interesting sort of show in town for us is joining up what we have and making that better and fit for the future. So a lot of our energy is focused on that. David? So we've already, unfortunately, lost a lot of our intercity connections from Stevenage and from Watford Junction, um, which um, is something that we're always fighting to get um, reinstated. Uh, but HS2 will provide ca more capacity on the West Coast Main Line. And so for, you know, residents of Watford, um, Hemel Hempstead, Tring Berkhamsted, um, that will provide more capacity uh, for those who choose to commute into London and those coming out to work. Uh, again, I talked about well in Hatfield being places that Londoners come to work in them. Well, we have Londoners coming to work in Watford as well at places like TK Maxx, the hospital, etc. So um, from my perspective, I think it will provide capacity and that's to be welcomed. And uh, you know, we're gonna need that capacity going forward. And if, if we're shifting the intercity capacity onto HS2, I don't see that having a negative impact on Hertfordshire. Graham, thank you. Thank you, David. Right, uh, we've done our best viewers to, to get around uh, as many of your questions as possible. And, and, and the panel have been fantastic in, in sharing their insights with us uh, but we've saved the best to last so the last few minutes uh rob rob bridge um does the panel uh believe as as duncan bell asks that it uh makes sense for individual local plan authorities to continue to pursue their own local plans if we need to look at growth holistically across hertfordshire so uh <laughs> duncan as as deputy leader of well in hatfield uh, I, I could imagine was going to ask that question and he probably hopes that I, I would answer it. So I think be really clear, one of the key planks that the MHCLG have, uh, have talked to us about is the need to get all of the uh, district and borough areas to have an up-to-date local plan in place as part of us negotiating and getting to a point of, of, of a deal. They very much see that we need to be ensuring that all areas have got the most up-to-date plan. That may change, that may change in some of the planning white paper uh, proposals that are coming, but at this point in time, we've not had anything to indicate to us that we can slow down or stop doing our local plan. Um, I think what's important is looking at the future and whether joint strategic plans, whether they are statutory or non-statutory, help 
beyond sort of the next planning period. Um, and that's really much how MHCLG have talked with us in the last few months. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you to our panel. It's uh, bang on midday. Um, it's, it's been an absorbing discussion. It's been wide ranging. We've had lots of, lots of insights and we've, we've tackled as many questions as we possibly could. I hope everyone's been able to take something useful from today. Thank you, panel, for being so lively and engaging, sharing your knowledge uh, today with us. Uh, please assume with confidence that our audience is applauding wildly over their keyboards <laughs> across the land. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Rob Bridge, CEO at Wellin Hatfield Borough Council and lead CEO at Hertfordshire Growth Board, and Patsy Dell, uh, Director of Hertfordshire Growth at Hertfordshire Growth Board, and Matt Partridge, uh, CEO at Stevenage Borough Council, and Councillor David Williams, leader at Hertfordshire County Council and Chair of the Hertfordshire Growth Board, and David Russell, uh, Area Director at Morgan Sindel. Thank you all. And thank you to the audience, you, our viewers. Thank you for your attention, your stimulating questions. Uh, we'll ask our panel uh, to respond to as many of your unanswered questions as possible after this session and post those answers on our social media channels. Meanwhile, you'll find a video of this session at the voiceofauthority.co.uk shortly. Uh, thank you, of course, to our sponsors, Morgan Sindel, who made all of this possible. And don't forget our next session on Tuesday at 8.30. How will agile data-driven strategies drive high street recovery? And save the date for our next session with the Hertfordshire Growth Board, when we'll be uh, assembling another crack panel to discuss uh, HGB and COVID-19 economic recovery planning, the wider growth strategy for Hertfordshire. Invitations to those sessions will be sending out to you uh, following this session. Until then, uh, goodbye from our panel, from me and from everyone at 3Fox. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.